Welcome to the PSRC's and Department of Commerce's Passport to 2044 webinar on stormwater planning. I'm Paul Ingram, the Director of Growth Management at PSRC. Uh, we have a great session lined up that we think you'll find very useful about, uh, about planning for stormwater and incorporating it into your comprehensive plan. Um, this is part of a series uh, acutely called Passport to 2044, uh, aimed at supporting specifically those conference of plan updates occurring this year and next year to meet that 2024 deadline under GMA um, and recognizing that some of our uh, fellow counties and cities outside of the Puget Sound region might be tuning in as well. This is our 14th passport event. Um, so we're excited to be continuing the series today. Our goal is for every community to successfully create a local plan that meets your community's needs and that address state requirements and regional goals, including advancing regional mobility, climate change, housing affordability, racial equity, and of course, environmental restoration. Sorry for the fire, <laughs> fire engine in my background. Um, we know that updating your plan is a lot of work um, and that many cities are overburdened trying to meet all the requirements that they face. We hope that this series of webinars and guidance information that we're publishing at PSRC and through Commerce is helpful. Um, it may not address all of your staffing needs, but hopefully this information is useful and helpful during your update. We want you to be successful. Um, like your comprehensive plan, the plan for the region is Vision 2050. It includes policy chapters similar to the required elements of your local plan. And we encourage you to look to Vision 2050 as a source for policy references and policy guidance as you work on your update. As I noted, this is the 14th Passport to 2044 event. Uh, past events cover most of the update topics that we've heard planners talk about. Um, including housing, climate and equity. Those have been some of the key um, topics for this update that we've received a lot of questions about. Um, several different um, categories of different subjects um, are included in the past webinars. We did one specifically for elected officials in May that you might be interested in. One, in. Um, it provides information tuned specifically for city council and planning commission members. So that might be a great one. If you do have a planning commission meeting, you want to provide them an overview of the comprehensive plan update process that could be very useful. We also did one about the legislative session. It really focused on how bills from the last session uh, might impact your comprehensive plan now or with coming requirements that, that follow on after it. So that could be useful. Um, links to all of these are available on our website where you can view the webinar and download the individual presentation. So, so several of these webinars, they have multiple different presentations. Maybe you just want a piece of it. You can download that individual presentation and make use of it. Uh, we're nearing the end of the 2044 uh, series um, to support the Puget Sound um, region, recognizing a lot of cities and counties, they're well underway. They've been working on these issues. However, Commerce is continuing a series for 2025 jurisdictions. So if you're one of the communities outside of the Puget Sound region, stay tuned with Commerce. They're continuing to do a series of educational um, events and webinars that you might be able to tune into. Um, I just wanna briefly go over today's program. Um, following my quick and their almost complete welcoming remarks, uh, Erica Harris from PSRC, We'll talk about the guidance on integrating stormwater solutions into comprehensive plan. I think you'll find that really useful. We'll also hear from the Department of Commerce. Um, they'll talk about both funding, which is always great to hear about, and stormwater planning projects and the sound choices checklist. And then we also have um, a couple of key staff from the city of Seattle that will talk. I think many of you know that going back 20 or 30 years ago, Seattle's been a leader in stormwater planning. Many of you remember the C Streets Initiative or uh, the Swell on Yale, different stormwater planning um, projects, innovative techniques and planning solutions that have happened over the years that Seattle has been at the forefront of. So we're excited to hear from some Seattle staff talk about their stormwater work and the strategies for how that can be integrated with the broader city conference of planning work. And hopefully there's time for some Q&A and we do have 
the uh, the question at the Q and A function here. If you want to put a question into uh, Zoom, um, we'll try to monitor it when time allows or speakers are able to. We'll might be able to address some of the questions that come up. So uh, just a few logistics uh, for today's presentation. We're recording today's uh, meeting and that will be shared and available on our website afterwards. Presentations will, the PowerPoints will all be available. If you have questions, you can ask in the Q&A. We appreciate it if you could stick around and fill out a survey at the very end of the event um, to help us meet our Title VI uh, requirements. And if you're an AICP planner, you'll be pleased to know that there are CMM credits specifically for the sustainability and resilience credits uh, are available with this session. Um, before we turn it over to the presenters, I want to acknowledge um, that the Puget Sound region is part of a larger area that is the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people who have lived here since time immemorial and ceded lands under duress. While each tribe is unique, all share in having a deep connection with and legacy of respect for the land and natural resources. Today's session regarding stormwater is really important because of the role stormwater has in water quality and Puget Sound recovery. How we manage and treat stormwater is a key part of how we, non-Native people, uphold our treaty obligations and respect tribal sovereignty. Uh, PSRC enjoys the active participation in regional planning by the tribes in the region. We, we thank them for their participation in Vision 2050 and for being with us through many of these uh, conversations. As you work on your comprehensive plan, tribes uh, can be great partners or resources on many different topics, especially those related to the natural environment. Um, tribes have limited staffing capacity, just like many of our cities. Um, it can be challenging for them to respond to all the different requests for information or for participation, um, but we do encourage you to reach out to them and try to engage them in your comprehensive plan update. We've updated our webpage with information about the tribes in the region, um, opportunities to engage them, and some guidance on how to best coordinate with tribes in your conference of planning. We hope that you take advantage of that. And lastly, I just want to note the, the basis for this. Um, as many of you that have been in the Puget Sound region for many years, um, the environment has been a core policy issue for this region for decades. Whenever we've gone and asked the public um, or had public opinion surveys, the natural environment, quality of the natural environment has always rated as one of the top priorities for people. It's why people move here. It's why people stay here. It's the thing that people love about the Pacific Northwest. And so it's been a policy in Vision 2020, in Vision 2040, and then during the update of Vision 2050, the region's elected officials put an even greater emphasis on the environment. They sought not just to protect it, but to restore Puget Sound and to accelerate the recovery of salmon, orc, and other species. And I really found that that, that word choice, that they want to accelerate, that they were recognizing that it wasn't good enough just to hold things as they are or even to work towards improvement, but they, they wanted to accelerate recovery. Um, planning for growth is an opportunity for us. There are times when growth and development can have um, significant impacts on the environment. It can mean the loss of forests, creation of new impervious surfaces, more pollution. And yet at the same time, um, development, if it's managed and operated and located in a certain way, it can have a beneficial impact. So that's really where we stand of managing our growth and development practices where new development could replace some of that old, say that old ugly parking lot with no stormwater controls might get replaced with new infill development that could actually improve water quality and lead to an enhancement of our, our environment. So we, we hope that you look forward to not just stormwater as a stormwater infrastructure utility, but how can stormwater be integrated into your plan to create a better environment for your and with that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Erica Harris for the first presentation. Thank you so much. Now I just have to figure out where's my stop share button. There we go.
Thanks, Paul. That was some great background and great framing for this. Uh, as Paul mentioned, my name is Erica Harris. I am a senior, senior planner in the growth management group at PSRC, and I'm really excited to see so many people here. Um, I wanted to think about, um, thank you all for, um, if you have contributed to this document on um, this guidance document on integrating stormwater solutions into comprehensive plans. I know uh, a bunch of the folks that we talked to signed up um, and really it was, um, we couldn't have done it without you. And I also wanted to acknowledge that David Pater from the Department of Commerce, who you'll hear about uh, from next, uh, also helped to develop this document. So for those of you less familiar with stormwater, I wanted to start out with a basic definition. Um, stormwater is precipitation that rather than um, infiltrate into the ground, runs off to the land and goes into either some sort of water body or a stormwater facility. Um, it's a, it can be a problem because uh, it, cause, it can cause erosion, it can change hydrology, and it can pick up pollutants um, like pet waste, fertilizers, pesticides, oils. Um, and we're learning more and more from recent research that tire wear particles, particles are also a problem. Um, they're many things in stormwater, but this is one that um, research has been found recently to be very lethal. If you hear 6PPD or 6PD quinone, that, that seems to be the culprit in tire wear. Um, so the graphic on the left shows um, stormwater going right from the road to into the water body, and you can see it's, it's lethal to the salmon there, um, particularly coho salmon, but other species as well. Um, however, there, there is a solution. Um, if stormwater is put through green infrastructure, it can uh, clean, clean the water and is no longer lethal or is le much less lethal to salmon. So if you'd like to hear more or see more about the urban runoff mortality syndrome, um, there's a great story map that goes into some more detail and is very illustrative. Um, so one reason I'm so excited about um, the folks here is that um, you represent a wide variety of disciplines. Um, and um, we, we think that collaborating across disciplines is how we're going to be su successful in improving the health in Puget Sound. And seeing all here makes me very hopeful that we can save our salmon populations and orca populations and, and everything that depends on water quality. So um, One Water is an approach that um, can help with this interdisciplinary um, work. It emphasizes that all water has value and it does encourage an interdisciplinary approach to working together to prevent and solve water challenges. Um, some jurisdictions that have taken a One Water approach have found that doing an interdisciplinary training on One Water principles can provide a good foundation for working on solutions together. Um, so because this is a, a promising strategy, I think you'll, you'll see some resources from the Puget Sound Partnership um, to help do this type of work. Um, you might see it called integrated plan or planning or integrated water and land use planning, uh, something like that. Um, but that's, that's the idea, that's kind of one water approach. And the American Planning Association has a water and planning network that can also provide a good resource for, for this type of work. Um, it's a forum for exchanging ideas. Um, this is not just planners, there are uh, a lot other types of disciplines that are in this network. Um, and it's really trying to be an exchange of best practices. Um, it does reflect on um, the current research science policy and technology. Um, they have frequent webinars um, to, to show the latest, latest and greatest. So if you'd like to join the network, all you have to do is email water at planning.org and they'll put you on. Um, and there's also a web page um, for the Water and Planning Network, and that's where you can access the webinars and their other resources. So before I get into the stormwater solutions guidance, I wanted to emphasize, Paul did this a bit already, that um, smart growth and, and the work that you are doing to um, work on compact land use, um, accommodate housing, help with um, walking, biking, and other active transportation. That's all really important for Puget Sound recovery. Um, so um, smart growth as a is really a kind of a best stormwater practice. Um, and that's why Puget, the Puget Sound action agenda has smart growth as their first strategy. Um, 
it's in the action agenda because it does consume less land, which results in less stormwater runoff per capita, lower vehicle miles traveled and the related uh, lower emissions and pollution, more walking and biking, less water sewer and other infrastructure, including roads, and it preserves more habitat. So the uh, graphic you see on the right shows different uh, scenarios for growth um, in a watershed. And you can see scenario C really does have that more, more compact um, growth um, pattern and a lot less of the watershed is developed. And if you wanna kind of dive into the research that was done on this, it's in EPA's Protecting Water Resources with Higher Density Development publication. I've got a link there. So this, this guidance on integrating stormwater solutions into comprehensive plans really was a follow on from some of the stormwater parks work that we did. You may have heard some of us talk about that. Um, we'd gotten questions about um, how stormwater solutions and other, um, or, or sorry, um, stormwater parks and other stormwater solutions can um, be supported by comprehensive plans. So we fairly um, quickly put together this document um, we wish it had been out, uh, you know, a year or more ago, um, but I think you'll still find it helpful. Um, there's a lot of uh, very kind of practical things in it that will kind of jumpstart this work if you haven't done it already. Um, I did want to acknowledge that the Growth Management Act does have stormwater, um, does have requirements to address stormwater in the land use elements, but um, it's not very prescriptive. Um, they're also related uh, critical areas and shoreline management requirements. Um, and of course, the NPDES permit, which is the, the stormwater fit, permit for you non-stormwater folks, um, those, those have requirements as well. So these kind of all work together. Um, but the focus of this document is not necessarily on um, specifically addressing the requirements, but on some kind of innovative and effective solutions that can, in the end, help to address requirements. Uh, the stormwater solutions are organized by plan element. Um, of course, you will do it very differently in your comprehensive plan since all plans are different, um, but we made some suggestions here. And there's also um, an emphasis on getting projects into capital facilities plans so that they can get funded and built. At the beginning of the document, we have um, some process suggestions, mainly just to um, add an inter interdisciplinary team at the beginning and end of your process. Um, so at the beginning, so that you can look for opportunities to integrate stormwater solutions and kind of do a gap analysis of, of where they aren't necessarily in the comp plan already. And then at the end for implementation, um, many of you who are working on comp plans are well into this process and you know it's still not too late to get together a team to get some um, input on your draft plan. So um, each stormwater solution um, in the document has uh, at least two model policies um, from around the Puget Sound Basin. I think they're going to be relevant for wherever you are. I know that there are people who register that are um, in other parts of Washington. Um, so I think it's most of them are still going to be relevant. There are also project and plan examples and other resources. Um, and some of you have example will have performance indicators in your comp plan. So there are also some example performance indicators. So I'll go through the stormwater solutions by, by element now. There is some information on requirements, um, but there's a lot of information out there already. So it's really just kind of linking to that information. Um, Regional stormwater facilities, um, it might seem surprising to you to see that in the land use element, but um, regional stormwater facilities are facilities that can manage stormwater from multiple parcels and um, even hundreds of acres. Um, and so um, they can be helpful with land use because they, um, you no longer have to do site by site, site stormwater management if you do have one of these regional facilities. Um, We've heard that they can be complicated, so you'll need to, to work together to um, figure this out. And we're also looking to uh, ways to remove barriers to um, getting more of these in. Um, the city of Redmond has um, a good regional facility program, and you'll see a link to that. Um, on the flip side, there um, in, with development, there might be an opportunity to um, add more green stormwater infrastructure than what's required, um, and incentives can be helpful with that. 
um, watershed based land use planning um, has been done by a number of jurisdictions and it recognizes that um, water doesn't necessarily um, respect jurisdictional boundaries and and uh, so doing it by at the watershed seal can be helpful and also um, using multiple um, departments and disciplines for this so it can address stormwater and natural resources land use things like that uh, transfer of development rights or tdr is a market-based mechanism that um, lets you transfer development rights from places you'd like to see less uh, development like farms and forests to places where you'd like to see more such as uh, urban centers and the landscape conservation and local infrastructure program um, it provides incentives uh, by providing um, infrastructure funding, including stormwater facilities. So that can help you pay for your, your stormwater systems um, when you're doing those you know, um, urban growth areas. Um, so um, and then open space corridors can um, help by providing some, uh, some corridors for recreation, for natural resources and the plants and soils that are there um, can help to uh, uh, clean, cleanse water that before going into a stream. And the natural environment element, um, we've got a number of stormwater solutions. Um, I had heard uh, when talking to folks that um, salmon recovery plans are often not integrated in the comprehensive plan. Each uh, water resources inventory area, area or RIA um, has their own salmon recovery plan. And, and more and more, you'll probably be seeing stormwater um, as strategies in those plans, as well as um, habitat and, and other strategies. Enhancing tree canopy cover, um, we're learning is more and more important for, for, even, for stormwater even. Uh, we know that it um, enhances quality of life, it keeps the air cool and clean, but it can also help with stormwater. And um, the King Conservation District and some other groups have done some research on this. So, to see some links to that in the guidance. Um, providing stewardship um, and protecting and enhancing habitat can also, can also help with stormwater. Um, they, the, again, the plants and the soils can help to cleanse water before it hits the, the water body. And then of course, reducing use of toxic products is, is a big water quality um, help. And you know things like pesticides and herbicides. Um, there, there are many alternatives to that, and there's some some uh, resources for that. I'll talk about stormwater parks in a moment. Um, there's also an opportunity to do kind of smaller interventions, um, low impact development in parks, uh, like rain gardens or some bioswales. Um, park access and funding. Um, that's just the idea that you know parks are places uh, with less impervious surface, so. Um, you're able to, if you have a wide distribution of parks and an equitable access to parks, um, you have more of those places where water can infiltrate and more opportunities for things like stormwater parks and low impact development. Um, environmental education, as long as uh, you know, you're know you talking about wildlife and habitat, you can also talk about stormwater. So just a bit on stormwater parks, uh, for those of you who hadn't heard of it, um, stormwater parks are community facilities that have both a, a recreation and um, a, a stormwater management component. Um, and some of um, the great uh, stormwater parks that we've already seen around the region are um, even treating hundreds of acres um, for, of you know area that hasn't been um, up to codes for stormwater. Um, and we have a stormwater parks webpage that um, showcases the stormwater parks that have already been built in the region, or at least the ones that I know about. And um, we also have a stormwater parks guidance document. You can see that on the right. Um, but people are really excited about stormwater parks, um, in part because beyond doing stormwater management and providing recreation, they can also address equity when they're built in areas underserved by parks. But because they help with uh, water quality improvement, they also support tribal treaty rights. Um, we all know that's critical for salmon recovery. Um, and and some parks don't don't necessarily have much wildlife habitat. So when it's a natural feature like a constructed wetland, um, that can add wildlife habitat. And what I've heard um, from people who have built those constructed wetlands, uh, the residents really appreciate the wildlife viewing that happens with those. 
And then finally, um, well, not finally, there are many other benefits, but I threw out that it can be funded by multiple sources and that's always helpful with building anything new. Uh, new roads do need to um, be up to have up-to-date stormwater codes and um, not uh, create fish passage barriers. But we know there are a lot of roads that aren't going to be um, redeveloped anytime soon. And so if we want to make sure the water quality is improved, um, transportation stormwater retrofits are going to be needed. And then other kinds of retrofits, ones that uh, fix fish passage barrier problems and improve habitat. There are a number of stormwater solutions that are utilities. Um, you might not be surprised to see stormwater planning. And really the focus of that one was on some of those innovation, innovative stormwater planning um, work that has been done around the region. So um, check that one out if you'd like to see some really great examples. Um, and then when for incentivizing rain gardens and low impact development, there, um, you know, there's an opportunity for uh, the private sector um, to, or private property owners to add, add these um, you know, best management practices in. So um, there are incentive programs that are shown in the guidance document if you want to see examples of that. Um, water reuse could be something like um, capturing water from rooftops and using it for irrigating landscape. Um, that's a, a nice way to um, use stormwater. And um, stormwater public-private partnerships are actually um, something that's kind of new to this area. We haven't seen very many of them. Um, Seattle has some and you'll get to hear about those, but um, they're more common on the East Coast. And I, I think you'll see some resources and helping to bring those here because they, they are quite effective. And finally, I, I have heard that maintenance is really crucial to um, helping with water quality. And sometimes um, stormwater maintenance is, is underfunded. So you'll see some policies on making sure that, that that gets taken care of. For capital facilities, it's, it's really just um, making sure that all of these projects that are in the different areas of the comp plan from fish passage barrier removals to stormwater parks to habitat improvement projects, um, that those, those all get in the capital facilities plan and get funded. So I'll back up one second and, and let you know there are also a few appendices. Um, there is one on um, critical areas and shoreline management, and that's really just kind of pointing you to some of the resources out there if you need them. Um, there's also uh, an appendix on funding resources, and you homework from David Pater about that. Um, so I won't go into that. Um, and then finally, there is a glossary. Um, and we're hoping that this can be helpful sometimes when multiple departments get together, they have different definitions for the same term or, or just don't necessarily use the same vocabulary. So we're hoping that that, that can be helpful. Um, and I know that uh, you, and kind of speaking of that, I know that um, you, you saw that we'd like to share contact information. So I'm hoping that that can be helpful in uh, letting you get in touch with folks from other departments, maybe even neighboring jurisdictions if you wanna work at the watershed scale. Um, so please don't hesitate to get in touch with me if you have any questions about that, but we're hoping that can help facilitate some, some of your collaboration. And uh, with that, I, I'll point out that the guidance document is there under our work slash Puget Sound Recovery. And now I will pass it over to David Pater from the Department of Commerce. Thank you. And I'll hopefully get this right and share my screen here. Pick the right option. Is that working for folks? Or wait a minute. Okay, there we go. Are we good to go then? Like it. You look great. Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, so thanks, Erica. Great presentation. And uh, as I already said, I'm David Pater with the Department of Commerce. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about stormwater planning, and but mostly about the funding sources, which does cover stormwater planning too. So I'm the National Estuarine Program Planner with Co Commerce. That's kind of a mouthful. Um, uh, but what I do mainly is I represent commerce on these strategic initiative lead teams for stormwater management and habitat issues. 
And then there's another team for shellfish issues. And so these three teams are part of a three-pronged interagency approach funded uh, by EPA to implement the Puget Sound Action Agenda. And as Erica mentioned, the even smart growth strategies. And we also assist with grant funding. We have um, advisory teams to also assist with that too. Let's see here. Get to the next one. So briefly, what do we do at Commerce? Well, overall, we strengthen communities. Uh, we offer, obviously, planning technical assistance, uh, as you know, with comprehensive planning, GMA. Um, also, public safety programs, various grant programs to assist um, all sizes and shapes of communities out there in Washington State. So I'm going to briefly go over this sound choices uh, checklist. So the checklist is a, it's a voluntary tool that helps local governments evaluate your comprehensive plan for habitat protection and stormwater management goals and policies that align with Puget Sound recovery and the action agenda, obviously. And it links to the guidance Erica just presented, the integration of stormwater solutions and comp plans. Um, and that guidance provides obviously a deeper dive into stormwater related topics uh, with examples and model language, but one is supposed to complement the um, other is the way it's um, ideally supposed to work. So a little bit of background uh, about the checklist and how it, how it came about and how it's been revised. Uh, so the Habitat Strategic Initiative Lead Team um, and Partners updated the Sound Choices Checklist. And Rebecca Brown, um, one of my team colleagues at DNR, she was the lead for updating the checklist. She's the land development and habit, land development cover lead under the Habitat uh, SIL. <laughs> so um, we got the checklist to align better with Puget Sound recovery priorities and with elements and topics included in a comprehensive plan. And you'll see that if you, once you get into it. And there, by the way, there is a hot link uh, to the checklist and to all the funding sources um, that I will go over in my presentation. I'll probably mention that repeatedly um, just to remind folks. So some of the partners for working on a checklist included the PSRC, Erica, um, myself at Commerce, uh, Fish and Wildlife, State Fish and Wildlife, Puget Sound Partnership, um, and also these stormwater strategic initial lead teams, as well as local planners reviewed various versions of the checklist provided feedback during the updated process. So overall, I mean, checklist is a, re is a resource for local jurisdictions to update their comprehensive plans. It has three main purposes. It encourages local jurisdictions to align their comprehensive plan updates with the Puget Sound Action Agenda, assist jurisdictions to recognize how their decisions and planning policies are advancing Puget Sound recovery, enabling jurisdictions to incorporate Puget Sound recovery and action agenda strategies into their planning decisions. And finally, it provides the Puget Sound recovery community, like nonprofits or other organizations, with a resource to use when making comments on local comprehensive plan updates. So now I'll get into some of the um, funding uh, programs. Um, I'm first going to talk about the Puget Sound National Estuarine Program Investment Plan. And this is spearheaded by the, the Stormwater Strategic Initiative Lead Team that I mentioned um, earlier, mainly by um, ecology, water quality uh, folks. So um, this plan was the early release of it was in July. And why they said early is because it only included at that time the not only um, the, the stormwater um, investments and the shellfish investments and the habitat investments uh, are going to be um, finalized over the next month or so, is my understanding. So I'm just going to cover some applicable stormwater investment priorities, a lot of sub investments under the heading of this big investment uh, plan. But the funding is it is EPA funding. Um, that we're, we're talking about here that, that the uh, state manages. Uh, so the first investment is focusing on the Sound Choices Comprehensive Plan. And uh, so it supports the Sound Choices Checklist and the uh, PSRC guidance that Erica just went over um, for updating and developing new sections of local comprehensive plans throughout Puget Sound. 
So this investment will be administered by Commerce. So if you are interested, you can contact me. Right now, there's six hundred thousand out dollars allocated to it. There could be more, uh, but we're still uh, kind of sorting that out a little bit. So the next investment option um, supports stormwater infrastructure analysis and retrofit planning and program development, uh, which is important for supporting activities such as site scale retrofits to create climate resiliency at a lower cost and promote a more adaptable approach. And there's about a million dollars uh, allocated towards that investment. So the next one is, is developing a, a clearinghouse, a centralized resource to house model policies and ordinances for local jurisdictions in combination with technical assistance to use and improve in water quality and future sound recovery objectives. And there's about half a million allocated to that. And finally, um, last one focuses on stormwater parks, um, increasing the distribution and effectiveness of the stormwater parks throughout Puget Sound, as well as building capacity in jurisdictions to maintain them all. And there's a million dollars allocated to that investment. So the request for proposals are still kind of in the works here for, for all these investments. Um, and hopefully in the, next, in the coming months, next four or five months, uh, they will be out there and, and folks can apply. Um, if they're if they're interested. So now I'm going to go over some of the, what the Department of Commerce has to offer for for grant programs. And uh, maybe I can get my script down here to help me out a little bit more than it is. So the first one is the Community Economic Revitalization Board or CURB program. So this provides funding to local governments and tribes for public infrastructure, which supports private business growth and expansion. So eligible, eligible projects include uh, domestic industrial water management, storm water management, wastewater, telecommunications. And uh, since planning construction uh, proposals are separate, uh, have separate due dates and wrote every two, rotate every two months. And, and again, all these all these hot links or hyperlinks, whatever you want to call them, are embedded into this presentation because there's a lot more on here than I'm than I'm sharing. I would probably need an hour for all these funding sources uh, to go through them uh, real comprehensively. So the next program is is called the CHIP program, um, connecting housing to in infrastructure program. So there's about $55 million available this biennium uh, in CHIP. Uh, so it supports the development of affordable housing by paying for water, sewer, and stormwater utility improvements. And also can uh, pay for waiving uh, system development charges for new affordable housing units. Cities, counties, utility districts may apply in partnership with a housing developer. Um, that grant program, the application period closes on October 31st. So the um, next program here is um, probably most folks are familiar with the Public Works Board. It's been around forever. Uh, it's a competitive uh, construction loan program. Um, so the applications are pooled on a quarterly basis and evaluated for funding. So the first pooling took place this past August and uh, the board awarded um, 4.3 million to eight qualifying projects. There's still about 3 million remaining um, in the in the loan fund uh, available for this fiscal year. Um, so it funds both pre-construction and construction of critical infrastructure, including stormwater. The last program uh, on the commerce docket here is the community development block grants. So um, these are oriented to small, small rural cities and towns and counties that are not entitled to receive similar funds directly from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. Um, so they can apply through Commerce to the CDBG grant. Uh, planning and infrastructure are, are eligible um, projects. So now I'll get into some of the uh, ecology uh, grant programs um, offered through their water quality program that apply to stormwater. Um, so the first one um, deals with stormwater capacity grants. Um, it's a non-competitive uh, program awarded to phase one and phase two NPDES, municipal stormwater permittees, a lot of jurisdictions, cities and counties in, in Puget Sound uh, for activities and equipment necessary for permit implementation. 
So uh, that grant program application period closes September 30th. So the next program is the, called the Water Quality Combined Funding Program. And it's sort of three programs in one. Um, so the first part is uh, entitled the Stormwater Financial Assistance Program, which is designed to fund stormwater projects and activities that are proven effective at reducing impacts for existing, from existing infrastructure and development and enha enhance existing stormwater programs. The next one is the State Revolving Fund that's been around forever. It's a, it's a loan program, provides low interest and for forgivable principal loan funding for wastewater treatment construction projects, eligible non-point source pollution control projects, and eligible green projects, including low impact development, planning, and implementation by both eligible. And the last uh, um, sub-grant program under this heading is uh, dealing with uh, non-point uh, source pollution. So the Centennial Clean Water Fund program provides grants for water quality infrastructure and non-point source pollution projects. And at the same time, uh, the EPA Section 319 grant program administered by the Bioecology offers funding uh, for similar non-point projects um, to the Centennial Clean Water Fund program, but not, um, uh, my understanding, not to, uh, infrastructure. And uh, so the, the application period is still open for the water quality combined fund drive funding program. It closes on October 12th. And there's a ton of information on the college's website about it. So that last but not least is the under the ecology banner is the regional state water statewide significant stormwater grants. Um, so these are competitive grants that assist stormwater permittees in completing projects that will benefit multiple permittees. Um, I think it's trying to promote regionalization like Eric talked about earlier. Um, thanks for listening. And uh, here's my contact information. And again, you can contact me if you're interested in the comprehensive planning uh, grant option and the sound choices checklist. I've also put Rebecca Brown's contact information in here if you're interested in more information about the sound choices checklist. And so I will pass the presentation baton on to Seattle for uh, their discussion on stormwater strategies and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. So great, thanks for inviting me. Um... I love talking about stormwater. I used to be, I used to work at a tree canopy program years ago and hung out with lots of stormwater people and talked about it a lot. But but these days I'm I'm talking about the comprehensive plan. And I'm Patrice Carroll. I work at the Office of Planning and Community Development uh, at the city of Seattle. And I'm part of a pretty large team that's working on the update to our comprehensive plan. Um, and in thinking about stormwater, I think one of the things that's really challenging for, for us at, um, at Seattle is there's so much great stuff happening on the ground and things are always advancing so quickly that our major updates, which don't come so frequently, are, are often a little bit behind of what's all that exciting work that's going, that's happening on the ground. So, um, so it's a good opportunity for us to to really kind of catch up, but then also look forward. Um, we haven't issued a draft plan yet. We began working on our plan back in 2021, um, and we've done a ton of work, but we're we're not yet ready to issue a draft plan. But here's how it's shaping up, and uh, and in this in the elements, you'll see that I have some highlighted, and those are the ones where we see this stormwater policy really popping up. Um, so very much like the way Erica described it in, in her guide in the PSRC guidance, there's a lot of different ways that stormwater expresses itself in the comprehensive plan. We get input from a whole range of different places, and we're going to talk about some of those now. But where I wanted to start was, was with what we hear from the community. And uh, we start engagement early and it's continuous. And it's, um, we don't hear the word stormwater very frequently, but we certainly hear a lot about 
stormwater in other words, when people talk about what they'd like to see. And, um, and oftentimes it's, it's those things that are not only helping to manage stormwater, but are providing other kinds of benefits that are super uh, visible to the community and beneficial to the community, the tree canopy, the green infrastructure, the healthy habitats. Um, and then we also hear a lot of concerns, and I think more so than we have in previous updates about flooding, about precipitation, about sea level rise and pollution and ocean acidification. So this is because climate change is here. And so these have become very intertwined with uh, the conversations about stormwater. Our elected officials uh, provide guidance to us and they do it through executive orders as well as council resolutions. So here's an example of just two that are influencing stormwater policy and executive order about the Seattle tree plan. So again, recognizing in that executive order that, that this is part of our stormwater management solution. Uh, we also had council last year uh, passed a resolution. This was when statewide climate legislation did not pass. Our city council wanted to step up and make sure that we were still going to move forward with the um, with the intent of that state legislation. And so they passed uh, a resolution that we would address climate change. And again, a lot of references to natural areas and the green infrastructure and how we could manage some of those environmental conditions that we're seeing through climate change. And our, our state and regional planning requirements. Um, I think I picked out the similar policies that Paul highlighted for you earlier, um, but we also have in King County, we have our countywide planning policies and, and these two are policies that we wanna align with. And so they too cover stormwater is, um, is highlighted for us as something to address in our comprehensive plan policies. And then we do have the state legislation that did pass in 2023, which um, was focused on climate, but had very specific things that are related to stormwater, um, particularly in the climate resilience sub-element. Um, and there were also new requirements for some of our other element. They're asking us to include green infrastructure as part of our capital facilities element. They're asking us to include a tree canopy analysis in our parks and open space element. So again, that connection between climate change and stormwater management is becoming more and more important. Uh, in addition to the PSRC guidance specifically on stormwater solutions, some of the climate guidance is also calling out different policies or different examples. And so some of the ones that we've looked at is Washington Department of Commerce, their uh, climate element planning guidance. And then also in King County, we have the King County Climate Collaborative and, and they've issued some guidance um, to, again, to help local cities and, and other communities um, to kind of prompt that thinking about how we address climate. Many, many of the suggestions are, uh, are related to things like green infrastructure and managing our natural areas. Um, and other, uh, a little bit more emphasis on the nature-based solutions than other kinds of solutions. And then, um, and then PSRC's climate guidance as well. Uh, one of the things from the start of thinking about our update plan was we definitely wanted to center community and, and, um, and in, in thinking about these are things that touch on not only on on uh, stormwater management, but really when we're in the policy making mode for all of the different topics. And, and in particular for stormwater, I think repairing past harm is, is something that's very important because we know that there, there are places in our city that are not so well equipped to manage stormwater as other places in our city. Uh, and certainly looking at vulnerable populations and those frontline communities as those climate impacts related to extreme precipitation and, um, and flooding and sea level rise, um, those, are, those are communities that we really wanna prioritize. 
And then just being kind of more specific and identifying what some of the racial equity outcomes that we want. And so this was a very helpful process to us in thinking not, again, not just about stormwater, but about all of the different topics that we, um, that we want to advance in the comprehensive plan. Yes, check. We did do a lot of interdepartmental coordination. We are a big city family here in Seattle. And so we had a, a large um, interdepartmental team and magical things happened when we were updating our comprehensive plan because it was also the time that our Department of Transportation was updating its long range plan. So we had the opportunity to have a joint interdepartmental team with our colleagues at the Seattle Department of Transportation. Um, so it's, it's a large group. Uh, it includes, it's mostly city departments. Um, and again, uh, our comprehensive plan touches so many different topics and, and even transportation is becoming more and more far reaching and impacting multiple departments um, with its directions. So, um, so we were able to collaborate in that way and really tie together our land use and transportation in ways that we haven't before. Um, because of the transportation aspect of, of this joint group, we also had some external, um, some external agencies, particularly transportation agencies, um, to, to sit with us and, and, and have an opportunity to share information. It was such a large group. There's not a lot of policy making that happens in, in this kind of a setting, but it was, um, it's really helpful to have a point person in each of those departments who's, um, who's briefed on the comprehensive plan, who's updated on the comprehensive plan, and can help us navigate to find those experts within departments that we need to work with. So we share information, um, we gather feedback. Um, we generally have quarterly meetings where, um, where we're updating this group on outreach that's going on or particular changes that are coming up, say with new legislation and things like that, and just generally keeping them informed, apprised, and then pulling them in when we need more specific help. And where do we need more specific help? When we're drafting those policies. So we did form these work groups, which were smaller groups that were focused on different elements of the comprehensive plan. And our, our navigators from our citywide interdepartmental team could help us identify who were the people who needed, who should be in those work groups. And this is where kind of more of the hashing out happened, um, reviewing existing policies, looking at um, a lot of policy that's been developed um, at the department level and seeing where it fits in the comprehensive plan, if there is a need to update at new policies. Um, so this, this was really where we, we kind of used this group to come up with our draft plan. Um, okay, here's a slide for the, the wonkiest of, of our, our planning colleagues out there. We are doing a full EIS for our comprehensive plan. And one of the things that we always struggle with is identifying what's a significant impact. So I thought I would share with you how we determine some of the thresholds of significance for some of the various EIS topics um, that are related to water and stormwater. Um, I'm not gonna read these out to you, um, but if anyone you know, has questions or wants to have more discussion, happy, happy to do that. And, um, and we will have our, our draft EIS, hopefully with our draft plan will be coming out um, sometime later this fall. So, uh, so that could be a resource for you as well. Um, one of the things that we were able to do for this update, um, some uh, funding was provided by the state to do kind of a really quick, very high level climate vulnerability assessment. Um, so in considering some of the, some of that drainage and wastewater infrastructure, um, their overall like kind of bottom line in terms of the physical vulnerability, um, the assessment did find that we're moderately vulnerable um, to the flooding associated with precipitation and sea level rise. So, so this is a problem that is here 
and, and one that we're increasingly going to have to address. Um, it also included a, a social and economic vulnerability assessment and no surprise that um, the, the communities and the, and the, the populations that were, are most vulnerable from a socioeconomic perspective are, are those ones in South Seattle, um, South Park, the flooding in South Park just that happened this past year, emphasize that even more. And so, um, so again, that's, it's, that's kind of a new framework that we're, we're looking to integrate into our comprehensive plan as well is those, those vulnerable areas and, um, and our vulnerable populations where perhaps extra effort is needed to manage stormwater. One of the other changes that we made in our plan was in our utilities element. Um, our utilities element was very high level. We didn't even really have specific policies about our individual utilities. Um, and there's just so much innovation happening there. And so we wanted to change that in this comprehensive plan. So still pretty high level, but we took it down a notch and we actually have a, a, a subsection in our utilities element about our water system. And I wanted to share the goal that we've, the draft goal that we have there because it is very much reflective of the one water framework. Um, this is something that has been embraced by Seattle Public Utilities and we are embracing it in our comprehensive plan as well. Um, So what are some of the draft policies that we've included in our plan? I've just, I've picked out a few. Um, obviously we're not, I'm not gonna read all of these, but I think it touches on some of the, the same areas that Erica had highlighted for us in the guidance. Um, and again, what this illustrates is that, you know, there is gonna be that, that cross kind of pollination of ideas about stormwater across our elements. And, um, and I think one of our challenges is in also wanting to make our comprehensive plan uh, manageable and digestible and not have a lot of duplication. And so something that we're still um, working on is, is how do we reflect that? How do we reflect the cross-cutting nature of, of issues like stormwater? so that um, people really know where to find all of those policies about stormwater, that they're not just, they don't just go to the utilities section and perhaps not find, find what they're looking for and just assume that we don't have a policy that, that deals with that. So, um, so I'm sure that that's something that you all are, are struggling with as well. So would love to know what techniques you're using in your plans. Um, we haven't totally solved that. So I think that's something that we'll probably be incorporating in our final plan, but, but not yet ready for our draft plan. And of course, the comprehensive plan is pretty high level. Um, and so we really lean on implementing plans and programs to really make this stuff happen. And these are just a few of some of the key departments that implement stormwater policies, as well as some of the programs and the plans that, that they are using to do that. And you'll hear more about um, SPU, so I won't say anything about that, but, but certainly in, in parks, um, they have a climate, they have a new climate resilience plan that, that definitely uh, includes a lot of direction about how they're going to, how they're gonna manage stormwater in our park resources. Um, and SDOT has not only this long range Seattle transportation plan, but also um, they'll be updating the Seattle Streets Illustrated, which is our right of way code. So how do we build out the right of way? And so, so that's something that's kind of due for an update and, and very much um, expect to see more of that green infrastructure approach as that, um, as those rules are revised. 
So next for us, like kind of beyond, assuming we get this update done and it's passed, but we still have some more work ahead. Um, we still have some things to fully implement some of the requirements that came out of the state legislation. Um, we don't really know what the state wants in terms of green infrastructure yet. Um, and also are the tree canopy analyses that we've done in the past, is that sufficient or is there something more that we should be looking at? We know we want a stronger connection to our hazard mitigation plan policies and actions. So we wanna do some more work with our Office of Emergency Management to um, kind of look beyond. Uh, I think in our hazard mitigation plan, earthquake has always been such an overwhelming um, threat that um, that we perhaps haven't paid much attention to, to some of the other hazards. And again, these natural hazards that we're seeing more and more because of climate change. Also an update to our shoreline master plan is coming up. So um, we're expecting updated guidance from the state uh, about reflecting sea level rise. And so again, managing that water is, uh, is definitely gonna be a driver of that update. So I am going to turn it over to my colleague at Seattle Public Utilities. And I just say one thing in, in closing that it's really great having folks like Sherelle at Seattle Public Utilities within our city family. It just allows us to sit down and collaborate because they share our values. Um, and so I, I really appreciate that, that we do have um, Seattle Public Utilities as part of our Seattle family, but I will turn turn it over to Cheryl now. Great, thank you, Patrice. Um, I do too. Uh, really appreciate that as well. That we're the that the utility is embedded within the city of Seattle, and it it really makes collaborating on the um, comprehensive plan um, that that much more fruitful. And and um, it's a good endeavor that we're um, taking on together. Uh, today, I'm going to touch on a lot of the great work that the city is doing with the main focus on the work by Seattle Public Utilities. Um, my name is Sherelle Ehlers, and I'm an engineer at the storm, at, at, and a uh, stormwater policy advisor um, at the drainage and wastewater line of business at, at Seattle Public Utilities for the city of Seattle. And my expertise is generally related to Seattle's stormwater code, which I'll mention. And hopefully you, you will bear with me on the other topics of which I have less knowledge, but I am excited to share with you. Um, and these will address some of the themes that uh, Patrice was talking about um, from the community, community engagement, such as increasing uh, tree canopy, mitigating climate change and removing pollutants from water. So just to start out though, I'd like to mention that to have a successful stormwater planning and implementation, um, we need, to, we need to have comprehensive and community-centered partnerships uh, through its whether meeting code requirements or during development or partnering with other departments, uh, regional uh, partners or those in our community. Uh, we can't tackle the problem alone and we all need to be a part of the solution. So next slide, please. Um, unfortunately, my... Uh, my notes are in delay for me. So uh, with Seattle's uh, comprehensive plan, many of the implement, implementation tools are, uh, many implementation tools are identified. And today I'll highlight a few of those tools that provide uh, concrete examples for positive stormwater impacts that uh, align with the different elements within the, the comprehensive plan. And then also many of these items I'll cover are also part of Seattle's stormwater management plan. Yeah. So to bridge both stormwater and climate change, uh, SPU's climate change work is guided by the utilities vision, community centered, one water, zero waste. And we work in partnership with climate scientists, peer utilities and community based organizations and take a holistic and integrated approach to managing water and waste cycles to build community resilience and steward our environment. Our approach is built upon the framework developed by the Seattle by Seattle's Equity and Environment Initiative and Green New Deal for Seattle, which focus on 
water and waste related community health. Next slide, please. Uh, the, as noted, and we, as we all know, when we listen to the news and otherwise, the Puget Sound region is facing major environmental, social, and economic challenges from climate change, seismic risks, racial injust injustices, popul population growth, and, and affordability. As stewards of public infrastructure, Seattle Public Utilities, drainage and wastewater line of business is responsible for protecting the environment and the community's health. We know investment in our infrastructure has the potential to provide multiple benefits in neighborhoods across Seattle. To develop truly multi-benefit investments, it is necessary to shift how projects and programs are designed by moving towards a collaborative planning process that includes our communities and cross-sector partners. Shape Our Water, a 50-year plan for Seattle's water resilience is our catalyst to do things differently. From confronting and responding to embedded systemic racism and injustice in past planning decisions to recognizing our future problems are not singular issues and applying a holistic and adaptive management lens. Shape Our Water is a work to create a more equitable and resilient future uh, through our drainage and wastewater investments. Racial equity, um, was a very important uh, component of the Shape Our Water planning effort from the very beginning. And before the Shape Our Water plan, SPU and other city departments, and this is probably, we're not alone. Uh, we had primarily relied on a complaint-based approach to understanding how our system performed. For the Shape Our Water system analysis, instead we used models to identify uh, risk risk citywide, focusing on outreach to ID problems with equity priority areas, incorporated racial and social equity into our prioritization process, and studied the social and environmental context of our work through a racial equity lens. Next. Now I'll move on to more of a land use element in general, which is the Seattle Green Factor. Uh, Green Factor is a score-based land use code requirement that increases the amount of and improves the quality of landscaping in new development. Uh, landscaping plays an important uh, role in the new development looks and functions. In functions, uh, Well-designed landscaping adds to Seattle's tree canopy, improves the look and feel of the neighborhood, and reduces stormwater runoff while it cools cities during heat waves and provides habitat for birds and beneficial insects and support, it supports adjacent businesses. Um, during development, if a project is required to meet the green factor, it must re reach a minimum score established by the zoning of the property. The property, the project can uh, choose from a menu of landscape credits for various features, including green roofs, rain gardens, vegetable, uh, vegetated walls and trees and shrubs. Projects can receive, also receive bonus credits if you plan along the sidewalk or in the right of way uh, and use native plants or create a food, a food garden. A little bit of a leg, so there we go. Um, another land use element is the stormwater code and specifically Implementing green stormwater infrastructure, or also known as on-site stormwater management, in some places also LID or low impact development. As the requirement, uh, this uh, green stormwater infrastructure is a requirement for most development projects. As an, a complement to green, Seattle's green factor, most of the landscaping requirements that I, that I highlighted for the green factor, such as bioretention, permeable pavement and trees, can also be used to meet the requirements of the stormwater code. As you can see over the years, the Seattle stormwater code has been very uh, successful in mitigating stormwater. Um, and, and, and as noted in the graph, um, stormwater code required GSI or green stormwater infrastructure facilities are projected to manage 200 million gallons by 2025 with 100 million gallons already managed since, since uh, 2021. Um, Many of the early requirements from the 2009 stormwater code were informed by Seattle Sea Streets, which has helped make Seattle stormwater code so successful. Um, 
Z Streets was com uh, completed in the uh, spring of 2001. And two years after monitoring shows that C Streets has reduced the total volume of stormwater leaving the street by 99%. And another, um, here's some other examples of natural drainage systems um, and that have been retrofitted uh, in challenging urban environments, including one in downtown Seattle and another in Lake City. Um, as, as far as partnerships goes, in the spring of 2019, the Seattle Department of Transportation and Seattle Public Utilities completed the first phase of new sidewalks on a natural drainage system along uh, in Northeast Seattle, and it's therefore making it easier and more pleasant to walk along the street. The NDS helps capture and treat polluted stormwater runoff uh, before it reaches the creek and improves uh, water quality and reduces pollution in Lake Washington. The, this project was selected as part of the sidewalk development prog, uh, program and as part of SPU's integrated plan to treat polluted stormwater. And um, here, and now I'm gonna, I'm, I know that we're kind of running out of time. So I'm gonna, it, there, here's another example of where we um, partnered with Seattle Public Utility, I mean, sorry, Seattle Department of Transportation. Um, another is flood protection. Um, there's two places here. Midwell, Midvale Pond up in the top um, was uh, installed pre where there was previously buildings located in at this low lying area that flooded. And also just currently uh, the South Park pump station was completed to uh, help mitigate some of the high tides that affect the street system, the formal street system. Uh, going on to the uh, stormwater parks, we've um, been able uh, to construct or uh, partnered with construction on various multiple stormwater parks in the city, including the Madison Valley Stormwater Improvements, the Thornton Creek Water Quality Channel and Meadowbrook Meadow Pond. Um, Additionally, uh, the first project uh, on the left is for North Henderson Combined Sewer Overflow Reduction, where a 2.65 million gallon underground storage tank beneath Seward Park was installed to reduce the volume um, of untreated stormwater that might overflow into Lake Washington. And as you can see, covered with tennis courts. And, it, and additionally, uh, in Northwest, Northeast Seattle uh, Thornton Creek Confluence Project was uh, uh, constructed um, to reduce upstream flooding and downstream flows. As a result, the Confluence Projects uh, led to a new two-acre floodplain and meandering channel for the existing creek and larger culverts, as well as improving uh, habitat and planting over 600 new trees. And in 2011, uh, the city has complemented this element, this uh, capital facilities element by adopting sustainable buildings and site policies. Uh, this uh, builds on our, our previous 2000 policy and it requires uh, all city pro owned projects that are new construction and, or major renovations um, over 5,000 square feet um, to meet the lead gold, um, as well as key performance requirements for energy and water efficiency, waste diversion, and bicycle facilities. So, and again, uh, as we look at uh, the reducing the impacts of car habitat and increasing the use of transit and walking and biking is one of the best ways to improve stormwater impacts especially uh, due to the recent discovery of tire, tire wear. And uh, Seattle continues to support various regional facility uh, transportation projects to reduce these impacts. Uh, I, know, I noticed there was a question about regional facilities and uh, we're trying to get a, go away from regional facilities, uh, but they still are necessary at times. And High Point's a great example of, um, of that. In fact, it, High Point installed uh, natural drainage systems throughout 
And be, uh, because of that, the pond was uh, reduced, uh, would have had to be five times larger if it wasn't for the GSI or natural drainage systems that was installed. Um, and the, again, the Capitol Hill Water Quality Facility, also known as Swell on Yale, is another retrofit um, to support Seattle's effort to provide water quality treatment to polluted stormwater before discharging to Lake Union. And we received grants from the Low Impact Development Competitive Grant from Washington State Department of Ecology and a loan from Washington State Pollution Control Revolving Fund. Vulcan was also a, a partner in this and provided both technical and other um, funding. Uh, and then going um, uh, beyond Stormwater Code is looking at other initiatives, which is uh, one a more recent initiative that's starting up is the Rain City Partnerships, and it's uh, to fund community identified GSI projects and encourage also community based outcomes. And then just for time, I'm just going to keep going. Um, and then are also we are partnering with development projects on those projects that go beyond code and SP is uh, collaborating the potential with potential uh, funding and technical assistance and maintenance support to expand um, these development pro uh, projects um, for better stormwater impacts. And again, um, RainWise is one of those incentive projects that we have, uh, programs that we have where we are helping uh, homeowners uh, reduce their stormwater impacts on their properties and that helps the city uh, reduce uh, combined sewer overflows as well, as well as improving stormwater health. And additionally, trees for Seattle, we have a volunteer stewardship program as well as free trees and, and even an uh, app that guides uh, people to, to check out different trees throughout the city. And then finally, um, climate and environment. Um, we need to build on our future and SPU uh, partners with local community, uh, local community organizations and uh, public and private schools uh, to expand stewardship for the future. And just to, but finally, just to build a truly multi-benefit investments to impact stormwater and climate change, we must build be uh, meaningful partnerships with local communities environmental organizations, other government entities, and many others. And so please be a partner with, with us in creating a water resilient future. And Great. I'm turning it over to Liz now. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you so much to all of our presenters. We've got a few questions uh, that I think we've got a few moments to answer here. Um, Sherelle, while you're on, I might just ask you a question specifically for you. Um, were there permitting barriers to being able to install these alternative infrastructure projects? I think anything new is always difficult. And so there was a lot of uh, collaboration with other departments, especially when working um, in the right of way and with the department of transportation. So there's always that back and forth and the fear and, uh, you know, of something new and risk and all of those things. So yes. Um, there were some barriers, I would say, but we're, we we work through them. Persistence is key. Great. Um, I think you touched on this first question, but uh, maybe in more detail. Um, how does a regional stormwater facility differ from a traditional stormwater facility built to serve multiple lots in a housing development? I thought these were what we were trying to get rid of with stormwater LID. Right, and that you're right. Uh, the High Point uh, community. Um, that project it incorporates both LID and as well as um, the a regional stormwater facility. So to get the infiltration and um, having small and distributed uh, BMPs on uh, best management practices throughout where we have resiliency and redundancy throughout the system, that's where the small um, green stormwater infrastructure or LID comes in. But for those larger storm events and trying to deal with those um, regional facilities are also necessary um, to protect the downstream system 
both environmentally and safety wise. Great. Um, question on metrics. Uh, do you have metrics to evaluate the effectiveness of policies implemented in improved water quality and stream flow? How is monitoring and adaptive management addressed? Are stream and river areas prioritized for action according to their wildlife and salmon sustainability for harvest as well as public enjoyment? Anyone who wants to, uh, wants to take a tangle that? I know there's some metrics that we have, that's, uh, but I don't have a, a good answer of what they are, And I, but I could work on finding out um, some of the metrics that we do. I don't know if there's others that want to weigh in. I'll just mention that um, all the stormwater solutions that are included were sort of based on research and, and you know the literature out there, plus you know talking with different practitioners. So you know, each of those you know, documents is going to have different types of metrics and research. But I think as jurisdictions um, implement some of these solutions, they're probably going to want to have their own metrics and monitoring. So um, that will differ jurisdiction by jurisdiction. Um, and I know there's a lot of work on sort of prioritizing. Um, so again, like PSRC doesn't necessarily do the planning. So we're, we're just going to sharing these best practices. So I think it will depend on um, you know, the different groups that are working on Puget Sound recovery um, and maybe by jurisdiction, or it might be kind of a more watershed approach to help prioritize um, these actions. Um, and I'll just add that in terms of a comprehensive plan, we actually had a metric for stormwater in the plan and we took it out because we only update it every 10 years and the way we, the data that's available and the way we measure is like changing so quickly. So so I would just, you know, that's something to consider as well. Great, uh, maybe just a couple more. So um, Sherelle, maybe back to you on this one. So could you say more about uh, de the desire to move away from regional facilities? So like, what are the main drivers of that? Well, it's something that the city has been doing in general, um, at least since 2001 with that C Street project. And it's basically, Basically having uh, small distributed areas that more mimic na the natural condition where you're getting infiltration and um, and getting the pollutants pollutant removal through those uh, green stormwater infra in infrastructure facilities um, that and then further moving on there's been through the MS4 the municipal stormwater permit. Um, requirements that we do low impact development or green stormwater infrastructure throughout the site to further mimic the natural condition. They found that just uh, matching the higher storm events, it doesn't uh, provide enough uh, benefit to the creeks and it's those small storms over time that really need to be managed. And that is why, um, and maybe it was a misnomer to say that we're going away from them, but they, it, we needed to add to um, what the ponds were providing and um, do green stormwater infrastructure to further mimic and add a uh, green space or uh, the hydrology that is associated with uh, green infrastructure. Great. Um, and then one minor correction, and then I think we can wrap up. So slight correction on the Public Works Board funding. We pool pre-construction awards quarterly, and there's 2.9 million available left in that fund. Construction awards are annual. We'll have 148 million available in construction funds in spring of 2024. So more on the funding. Um, David, is there anything else you'd like to add on that? Uh, no, thanks. And I communicated with Max Wedding. He's the head of the program. And if anybody uh, wants to get more information, um, contact me. But the program is under some changes. So that's why we didn't get it exactly right. And I just wanted to mention, uh, I forgot to mention the role of the Washington Stormwater Center with the strategic stormwater strategic and sort of lead team. They've been involved since 2016. Great. All right, well, I'll pass it back to Paul. Oops, have to make sure I unmute. Uh, thanks, Liz. And I want to thank Sherelle, Patrice, David, um, and Erica all for great presentations. A lot of in-depth information about stormwater and talking about it in a planning context as to how to integrate it. I especially liked, Patrice, how you were talking about, or was that Sherelle? <laughs> 
that that a comp plan is really a 10 year cycle and a lot of this stuff changes. And so trying to find that right balance uh, of integrating with your comprehensive plan, thinking about it holistically, yet at the same time being flexible and adaptable as uh, the science on this changes. So I want to thank you very much uh, for participating. I thank all the attendees for being part of this. And hopefully we answered some of your questions.